We're going to get started in just a minute. We can't seem to come to a consensus as to what actual time it is. The phone <laughs> says 1.30, Catherine says 1.28, computer says 1.32. We're just going to give it one more minute for people to sign on. Okay. So welcome everyone or welcome back to Write Your Own Memoir Part 2. Brought to you by SHARE and the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network and featuring our special guest Abigail Thomas. My name is Christine Benjamin and I'm the Breast Cancer Program Director at SHARE. So before the presentation begins, let me tell you a little bit about SHARE. We are almost a 40-year-old nonprofit organization that helps people through breast or ovarian cancer, offering the unique support of those who've been there. Our services are free of charge and include helplines, support groups, and educational programs. SHARE provides extensive programming for women and men living with metastatic breast cancer. For more information, check out our website at www.sharecancersupport.org. So let me tell you a little bit about the format of this program and how you can participate. All participants will be muted so that we can all clearly hear Abby speak. If you have a question during or after the presentation, please submit the question through the question pane in your control panel. You can access the question pane by clicking on the red arrow in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Uh, either during the presentation or once the presentation is over, we'll open up for questions and I'll read the questions directly to Abby. So I'd like to introduce Catherine O'Brien, who's a board member of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. Hi, Catherine, and thank you for all the work that you did to get Abby to, to work with us today and all the work you did to make this possible. You're welcome. Thanks, Christine. Uh, my name is Catherine O'Brien, and I have been living with metastatic breast cancer since 2009. As Christine said, I'm a board member with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network, MBCN, as a national, independent, nonprofit, patient-led advocacy organization dedicated to educating and empowering women and men living with metastatic breast cancer. MBCN advocates on behalf of the unique needs of all who are living with stage 4 breast cancer. In 2015, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Forum at the Susan F. Smith Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston will be presented in conjunction with the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. Watch for more details at mbcn.net. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to say thank you to Lapia, Rania, Deborah, Dorothy, Sharon, Lisa, Judy, Jean, and Kathy for their submissions, which we all so greatly enjoyed. And now to tell you about today's speaker. Abigail Thomas, the, renowned, the daughter of renowned science writer Lewis Thomas, author of The Lives of a Cell, is the mother of four children and grandmother of 12. Her academic education stopped when, stopped when pregnant with her oldest daughter. She was asked to leave Bryn Mawr during her first year. She's lived most of her life on Manhattan's Upper West Side and was for a time a book editor and for another time a book agent. Then she started writing for publication. Her first three books, Getting Over Tom, An Actual Life, and Herb's Pajamas were works of fiction. Her memoir, A Three Dog Life, was named one of the best books of 2006 by the Los Angeles Times and the Washington Post. It won the 2006 Inspirational Memoir Award given by Books for a Better Life. Abby is also author of Safekeeping, a memoir, and Thinking About Memoir, and the soon-to-be-published What Comes Next and How to Like It, a memoir coming out at the end of March from Scribner's. She teaches writing workshops and leads the memoir group at Kingston Oncology Support Program of the Health Alliance of the Hudson Valley. Abigail lives in Woodstock, New York with her dogs. And welcome, Abigail. The floor is yours. <laughs> it sort of scares me when you say the floor is yours. <laughs> um, 
thank you everybody who sent in a, a work because I was amazed by all of it. It was there was so much variety. There were words to live by. There was raw emotion. There was thoughtful reflection, fear, gratitude, loss, and reconnection. Cancer head on. Cancer mentioned as part of a larger piece. The whole gamut. There were descriptions that took us into attics and basements with such detail that I was very glad I wasn't there. Although <laughs> I, it was, it, they were wonderful. Um, what I'm going to, what I do usually in a workshop is that two people will send out works that we then think about for a week and talk about when we meet again. And I'm going to try as best I can to talk about these pieces and what my experience of them was and why I so particularly was, was drawn to them. One of the assignments was to write two pages, the second sentence of which was, it's not funny. And a really wonderful piece came to us, which I'm going to read part of. A good friend of mine who had gone through the breast cancer experience a few years before me used to joke that between us there was only one boob. We joked about chemo and surgery and the fact that we got to join an exclusive club when we wish no one else ever joins, though we know many unfortunately will. We knew that we had to laugh. We had to make fun of this disease that had affected us or it would win. The next sentence is a sentence I can't imagine having been written. My favorite story about my cancer, I mean, imagine, imagine writing that. My favorite story about my cancer is when I received a notice for a mammogram appointment a week after I had a bilateral mastectomy. I can't. I, I, I mean, kudos, kudos to you to even be able to say my favorite story about my cancer. Then there's a wonderful bit which goes like this. Recently, a North Carolina state representative introduced a bill criminalizing nipple exposure. Though this would affect possibly a small minority of women who bear their breasts for various political, sexual, and who knows what reasons, it would also affect the mother attempting to breastfeed her child when out and about. I am a strong supporter of breastfeeding and know that although most try to do so modestly, there are times when the dreaded nipple may be inadvertently exposed in the public arena. Nursing in bathrooms could solve the problem, but it isn't comfortable or, in my opinion, sanitary. There were protests planned, and I had an idea. I'd stand in front of the police who would be ready to arrest any woman exposing their breasts and make a big deal of preparing to unbutton my shirt. As soon as I had the cops ready to slap the cuffs on me, I'd rip open my shirt and wait for the look of befuddlement as the cops see that although as the cops see that although I've exposed my chest, there are no nipples or breasts to be seen. But the bill died and the protesters went home. Yes, breast cancer is not funny. Just the word cancer conjures up thoughts of horrible treatments and equal hor equally horrible deaths. You worry about your loved ones being left behind. You dread going bald. And you hate how your life goes from juggling play dates to juggling doctor's appointments. But having a sense of humor can make dealing with this disease less scary and according to some health professionals, laughter lowers the body's hormone and cortisol levels and strengthens the immune system. Personally, I found that if I didn't laugh at these things, they would overwhelm and depress me. I simply took a step away from my fears and looked at this from a different angle, and I found more things to laugh at than I thought would be possible. That's, that amazed me. That was just amazing to me. The, 
whatever it takes to be able to stand back and find something funny or amusing in this terrifying disease. That just, it's courageous. And it's contagious. The next piece, and it's also marvelously written, the next, the next two pieces I'd like to talk about are about loss and reconnection, loss and a kind of triumph. Son dies, 39 years old, blood clot, leg. I am done, can't get up, in total shock. Can't breathe, God help me, want to die. Need help again. Have two daughters, must live, get up, just walk. The emotional pain. I must pray, I need strength, just walk. Son named Dan. Dan, come back. I am lost. Yet again, this time worse, my only son. Are you okay? Please answer. You must come. I need you. I feel you. Is it you? I feel warm all over me. Is it you? Yes, Mom. I can't stay. I'm okay. Don't leave me. I must. I'm okay. I love you. Live your life. Yes, Dan came. It really happened. Dan in heart. Love you, Dan. So there is the incredible loss, and then the son returning in a dream or in reality. Who's to say? Then there's this final piece by the same person. Cancer back, lining of lung. Oh no, why God? Chemo, radiation, harder this time, older and weaker, still strong. I am grateful for each day. I am kind to all. I smile. I inspire people. My life is good. Wow, is all I can say. My life is good. And time after time, these kinds of feelings return in these in these stories from you all, and I'm in awe. The next piece is also a story of loss and reconnection. This time, a woman who fell in love with a young man who loved water, and they went canoeing, they did everything together, most of the time in water. And then there was a special trip, best buddies, a long weekend. They left me. They didn't call. I was nervous. He's late. I'm waiting. I felt worried. No answers. He's late. What's going on? Knock on door. Police have questions. Can't be happening. He's not alive. My life ended. I'm 24. So wrong. He was 27. I'm alone. Did this happen? Yes, it did. Such a loss. So much chaos. My best friend. My fiancé. What now? Call family. Cancel wedding. Can't understand. Drowning in water. He was experienced. They had life jackets. Swept away forever. Rapids approaching. Can't believe it. I can't live. I want him. I need him. He's my fiancé. He wooed me. He loved me. He left me. And then later, we get, this is a dream. We get married. I wake up. It's a dream. I miss him. I ache. I'm lost. He was 27. I am 24. I fear water. I won't forget he loved water, canoeing every chance. I still dream he was mine. He's my angel. Thirty years later, I think fondly he loved water. So the first part of this poem is so immediate 
it's exactly as it must have felt when it first happened. And the second half, 30 years later, I think fondly, he loved water. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, the perspective of 30 years and the ability to love what he loved, maybe without the same raw emotion of loss. It's interesting how many people wrote to the assignment of two pages that take place entirely in water. This is another one, my life in water. I love my life in water. The sound of it bubbling, dripping, crashing, rushing, lapping. Water floats me, frees me, surrounds me, calms me, the taste cool, wet, quenching. Water surrounds me, in it, on it, ingesting it, watching it. The look of it, blue, aqua, turquoise, white caps, white waves, twinkling, sparkling, bubbling, rippling, reflection, clarity and stillness. It is life-giving, life-sustaining, and life-taking. Water is my life. And this sounds and feels like water. All of these descriptions, both visually and in your ears, are, are, are like water, bubbling, dripping, crashing, rushing, lapping. And then the feeling it gives you, the calming feeling. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful poem. There were also a whole bunch of people who wrote the 10 year, three, three word sentence, two pages. And there was one I, I, that made me laugh, um, but also made me curious. This is the second stanza. My sister came. She was red. She was fat. She slept lots. Mom loved her. Dad loved her. I was jealous. I was bad. Mom spanked me. Then there's a third child born. Carol is born. She is pale. She looks angelic. We like her. We are three. She grows fast. She babbles a lot. Diana's her mom. I'm her mom. Mom, her, Mom's her mom. Too many moms. Mom yells a lot. Dad gets quiet. We hide sometimes. And there's a moment when I want more. We hide sometimes. Sometimes in these three-word sentences, there's a place to begin or a place to elaborate. And mom yells a lot. Dad gets quiet. We hide sometimes. It's one of those places. I would like very much to know more about that. But it's a sort of triumphant end. I'm even taller, I ride bikes, I play football, I cook suppers, Diana does dishes, I bake cookies, I decorate cakes. We celebrate me. I'm one decade. There was an, ass an assignment I gave, nine things I do remember and nine things I don't remember. And every now and then in these assignments, there's something... I want to ponder. And the first sentence of this assignment is, the ability to forget is equally important to human beings as the ability to remember. Now that just stopped me. The ability to forget is equally important to human beings as the ability to remember. That's a wonderful thing to think about. That's a one, I mean, I just, I, got you, I wanted to write my own essay about that. It was, it was terrific. And the things that followed were honest and true. The last of it is, life is too short for bad memories. And I think we have to learn getting past any painful past, especially anything related to cancer, and learn how to live a fulfilling life that is absolutely amazing on a daily basis. Empowerment 
should come from within. And that's one of the things that's repeated again and again in these pieces. Live life on a daily basis. This is all about the moment. This is all about now. It is, it's one of the things I've learned from the group I have, and, and this group too. Another of the assignments I gave was things I miss. I miss the feeling of falling in love, something I only really experienced once. Oh, I had many crushes and thought I was in love many times, but it only happened in its truest form when I met my husband-to-be. He was sitting at the breakfast table of my cousin's house, and I had come to do my laundry. It was a tsunami of feelings and hormonal urges clashing against my better judgment and logical thinking. He was a recent widower, unemployed and 12 years older. I was naive and a dreamer. Though he fit my parents' wish of religion and cultural sameness, his financial and professional prospects weren't adequate for them. But you can't fight true love, and I gave in to those feelings head first, and eventually my family came around. Falling in love eventually turns to a different kind of love, less upfront and more substantial. Though the love for my husband is stronger now and keeps growing, I sometimes miss that feeling of overwhelming wonderfulness of each touch, glance, and thought of him I once experienced. That, I think, I mean, now it's me talking, that's a universal, that's a universal feeling and beautifully rendered, really. You do, you, do, you love what you've got, if you've got it, and that strong, that strong connection that's weathered a lot of storms. But every now and then, oh God, how wonderful it was to start how wonderful those feelings were, and you miss them. I'd given an assignment, now I can't remember whether it was afraid of the attic or afraid of the basement, but this is a piece about a basement. When I was 11 and lived out in the country, in the, I was 11 and lived out in the country in the coastal hills of California. There's, I'm, you know, I'm, I've, I've skipped a page. Another scary basement. This one all lined in concrete, bare gray space without light or storage or life. There was an open stairway from the back porch into the basement. We used that back door to get into the house. Once, a rattlesnake got down there. We heard it shaking its tail like a small, dry castanet. Once heard, that noise was unmistakable, a terrifying sound that left my mouth dry and my legs immobilized. Daddy was at work. Mama was sleeping. She worked night. We woke her up and got the rifle from its shelf in the kitchen. Mama hated guns and had learned to shoot under protest. But we depended on her. We crowded around her as she approached those dark stairs, the snakes rattling, magnified by our fear. Just then the milkman drove up. He was met not by the friendly children he usually found at our house, but a small frenzied mob shouting all at once, snake, shoot, rattler, basement. That poor man handled himself well, shot the snake many times until the head separated from its body and it was obviously dead. Then he asked for a glass of water, and he sat and drank it and told us just how scared of snakes he had always been. We bought extra milk and cheese that week, and I never went into the basement again. And for me, that's a perfect story. That's, that's just a wonderful story. Um, I don't know what else to say. I, I, um, I'm down there with you. 
You know, I would uh, add to that. Uh, I was, I had that same reaction. I was down there too, and I think <laughs> that the author um, really. Uh, one of my teachers always used to refer to Chekhov and the pistol on the mantelpiece. Oh, and right. The pistol's on the mantelpiece, someone better fire the gun. And mm -hmm. what I liked is this, of the milkman, first of all, the milkman has a glass of water. And the, he's like, I, I had know. A glass of milk. <laughs> but, he has to have a glass of water. <laughs> right. But I liked that the detail of we bought extra milk and cheese. I do, too. You know, and I think that's just wonderful that the the person has sort of given full given a lot of thought to um, as you said you know what you know what to put in there. So no, I agree, and it's very important that last detail. We bought extra milk and cheese. It's just it's a it's a wonderful story, and it's wonderfully told. There's a lot of other you know detail and other story, but that was the part that just grabbed a hold of me. There's another story about water that I will read part of. I grew up in water. I learned trust while smelling acrid chlorine and hearing the thwack, thwack, shiver and shake of a diving board echoing against the cool tile walls of a sports and health club. I remember slowly submerging my goose-bumped skinny body into the blue water, fearful I'd let go and drown. My Uncle Moose was waiting for me, five foot, two and a half inches of solid ground in a sea of anxiety. Just breathe, he'd say. I'm not going to let anything happen to you. Now turn over, make a tea with your arms, and relax. I've got you. And so I learned to float with a strong hand under my back. I remember his deep voice in my ear. The more you struggle, the more you sink. Sometimes you have to just let go and float. Now there are words to live by. And they come back, they come back at the end. After this writer has experienced a very difficult time with her mother and her mother's second husband, who turned out to be, well, for lack of a better word, nuts. And she called her father after many years and said, could she come back? And she lay in the backyard in the, in the pool. And I'm just going to read the last paragraph. As I floated, I heard the stories of how my father had tried to intervene so many times. I'd never wanted to leave before. I'd immersed myself in my mother and the lives of my small brothers and felt I had to be there to keep them safe never seeing until now that I had to save myself before I could save them. Sometimes I wonder if those years without water caused my bones to become dry and brittle with anxiety, fear, and grief. I wonder if my cells had been plump with happiness and joy and safety, if cancer would have stayed away. But it is here, and I've learned to manage the fear. When I start struggling and sinking into, this, into the despair, I hear my uncle's voice in my ear. The more you struggle, the more you sink. Sometimes you have to just let go and float. To remember, I mean, everybody, I think, or many of us have had moments when somebody said, just the right thing at just the right time. And it comes back and back and back when you need it. And I can't think of better words than sometimes you just have to let go and float. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful piece. There's another piece by a woman who has suffered a lot. I mean, not that we all haven't, but this particular person has a child with bipolar disease and has been a threatening person, has wielded machetes to her mother, has been incarcerated, all kinds of all kinds of very difficult, very difficult moment. But almost every paragraph ends with all is well. 
Stress is everywhere, but I'll survive. Loving new position, all is well, all is well. Writing, 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 many things uncovered, light shines brightly. Oldest at home, looking towards future, much brighter days. I'm not sure where people get this kind of courage or whether you're born with the ability to see as well as experience the darkness, but to see possibility. Very, I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed with, with everything here. There's another piece, which I will just read part of. A diagnosis of cancer, or any life-threatening disease for that matter, changes your world. It impacts the world of those around you. For me, most of these changes have occurred subtly and slowly over time. It's like one day you wake up and realize how much things are different. But then there are defining moments, like in August, that are sharp and cutting. These moments throw you into a hurricane of emotional torment, a whirlwind of regrets, unfilled dreams, things you'd like to resurrect. I was succumbed in a gushing flood of things I will miss now living with this disease. There are some obvious ones, of course, like my breasts, which were just average size, but I loved them because they made my clothes fit well. And then there are my nipples. I really will miss them. They were so extra sensitive and with the right tweak would put me in the throngs of deep orgasmic pleasure. My oncologist said that reconstruction is not an option for me. Then there are the not so obvious things I miss, like the thought of even appearing sexy and whole when I take my clothes off before intimacy. Yeah, yeah, I know, I am whole and well, even though my body parts are in someone's lab or in a landfill. I know that something else I need to work on, my body image. I've been counseled to embrace my scars, tell my body that I love it, and look in the mirror at myself and express how fine I am. Fake it till you make it. I hear you. Besides my body parts, I really miss my husband, the father of my two children who died. He transitioned eight years ago. We weren't married when he died, but that didn't impact our love for one another. I miss his gentleness. I miss his caring for me when I was sick or under the weather or recovering from childbirth. I miss his cooking and serving me in the bed. I miss having a dedicated, loving soul to travel this journey with me. Going through this disease without him or any loving partner is torturous. I miss his tenderness and caring. I miss that I can't even call him and hear his consoling voice. I'm tearing up now, caught in my victimhood of sadness. That's raw emotion. That's hard to write. But it's very real here and courageous to put on the page. It's It's... Well, it is what it is, but I really loved it. Yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to embrace my body, but I don't yet. Yeah, this is what I miss. And she's overcome, and she writes it, and that's real. There's a piece. Um, about an attic that I really, the, the description of which was, was so, <clears throat> so real that I could feel myself in there. The attic always called to me to explore it, to discover treasures that may be hidden there or old memories packed away for another, another time. It was also such a contrast to the nicely furnished walls and carpeted floors of our mid-century house. Trusses and beams, rough wood flooring and plywood ceiling made up this space, 
and the color was all within the brown and yellow spectrum, neither of which was used in the main part of our home. It was partially floored, and I was admonished to stay away from the edges with the pink cottony insulation that offered no support for foot traffic. I learned the hard way that as I got taller, the rafters had a way of knocking stars into your field of vision if you stood up too quickly. There were strange-looking tubes that snaked around the attic floor like the tentacle of an octopus that were hard for me to climb over, and I thought dangerous to touch. Wow. <laughs> and then a little later, an old, <clears throat> an old crib was in pieces and propped against the side of the attic. Next to it was my father's old army trunk with stiff leather mittens, several hats, and other odd bits and pieces. In a box nearby was a nearly life-size doll whose eyes used to open when she was stood up and close when she was laid down. Only now just one eye would close, so she stared one-eyed up at you when you opened the box. Most of her hair was gone and her dress was torn. There were other dolls in the box, some I remembered getting for birthdays and Hanukkah. Others seemed to have always just been there. There were old lamps and fireplace tools and empty boxes for various small appliances tossed about. What both attracted and repelled me were the carcasses of dead, dried-out lizards that could be found in the screens under the roof vents. They sought shelter but found only death. It always made me think of a witch's brew, eye of newt, tail of lizard. In fact, I sometimes thought that this was where the witches lived, since my brother told me I wasn't really his sister, but something the witches dropped on our doorstep. Pieces of dead, dried-out roaches gave this notion more credibility in my young imagination. I'm in that attic. I see all the mysterious boxes and things that have things you can see and can't see, the history of a family, the history of a family, you know, before this family. And it's just, and then the idea that the brothers said, you're not really part of this family, you're something, the witches dropped at our door. How many brothers have told their sisters, you're not, you know, you're you're not you're you're adopted. <laughs> it's just it's just a perfect it's a perfect depiction of childhood using this extremely good evocative description of a place you're not allowed to go but go anyway, and the mystery there. There's another person who wrote the things I miss. And this, again, is not starting at the beginning. It's sort of in the middle. I miss each of the non-human family members, the dogs, cats, birds, even the fish, turtles, and reptiles who shared my life at some point. They were my friends and teachers, protectors of my children, and constant entertainment. When I was recovering from my chemotherapy, they were my constant bed companions. There were times I'd wake from a nap with a cat and dog under each arm, my angel wings, I used to say. Yet I know that they are all still with me in mind and spirit, and at times I can actually feel their presence, though their earthly forms are long gone. This is a moment, this is an essay in which cancer is sort of mentioned only in passing. The things she misses. She misses her father. She misses her mother. She misses the animals. And that's the only moment when cancer is discussed. So there's cancer head on and there's cancer side, sideways, off, off at the side, but very real. I also want you to remember that. You know, what? 
Oh, I was just going to mention we also had um, a very interesting perspective. Um, we had a caregiver um, uh, mm -hmm. submitted uh, some writing about um, not only being a caregiver and as anyone would be being on in unfamiliar territory in, in cancer, but um, she uh, was not a native English speaker and she had, I, what really I was so moved, she wrote about um, not knowing uh, what metastases meant and having to then like translate exactly. it. Exactly. And the difficulty of being the caregiver. I'm trying, I think this is, I think I know which one this is. But I think it's the ability to forget is equally important to a human being. Yes. As the ability to remember. Yes, and this person became an advocate an advocate for, or a, a, a trans, <laughs> is a translator for people of her language who don't under, who are not familiar with English and that kind of enormous help. And also just mission, you know, this is, this is what I'm meant to do. I wish this weren't the way I was meant to do it, but this is what I'm meant to do. I'm glad you're chiming in because I don't always, you know, I have only my own, I have my own take on these. And there are a million different ways to discuss what this writing is. I'm going to end with, I'm going to end with part of a, an essay about there are many things I miss. I'm going to die soon. And there's nothing anyone can do to stop that. We're all terminal, but the old adage is true, because ignorance really is bliss. My bliss was shattered when my ignorance was taken away, and I really missed not knowing. I miss trying to talk my husband into a second child, and I miss, I miss people not looking at me with sad eyes. I miss wondering if I should go to art school or not. Or maybe I should just start an animal shelter instead. I miss the ignorance of leading a life without the worry of what it will feel like when my liver fails. I really miss not knowing that I'm going to die of metastatic breast cancer. Here are the gifts I've been given, though. I have a unique perspective by viewing life through a very rare set of lenses. I get to live my life as a young mother with an acute awareness of her own mortality. Almost nobody can look through my lens and see the same colors. I'm no longer worried about finding a great job or conquering the world with my amazing ability to balance PTO, a nutritious dinner, and fantastic, and fantastic window treatments. F dot dot the curtains. I'm grateful that for a short period of time I can slow down and watch my daughter, drink tea, do puzzles, read a book, have friends over when I'm wearing pajamas, contemplate, grow, love. I miss my life before when I was ignorant and life seemed limitless, when my biggest worry was finding a public school job and getting my daughter into a good daycare. My life was great. I would never trade back, though, because the life I have now, though shortened and filled with a lot more sickness, is completely amazing. I'm finally proud to be me because I truly know what matters to me. I would never give up the chance to appreciate every second of my husband and daughter because now life is so much richer. You're welcome to stop by any time, man or woman. We can sit in silence or not. Everyone is welcome, though all cannot see. I found that incredibly beautiful and welcoming. And just a perfect example of what happens when you know that time is limited and you live for right now, right now, which really is all we have. 
there isn't anything except right this minute. And people, people who are ill have something to teach us. We can learn from. I really loved all these pieces. I know that there are things I didn't, I didn't emphasize, and I'm hoping that um, Christine or Kathy will be able to bring up piece, parts of these excellent pieces that I thought were excellent too, but wanted to use to, um, I just wanted to use in my own way, because I learned so much from them. I learned, I learned so much, and I wanted to thank you all for trusting us with, with this work, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of courage. So thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Abigail. And, you know, even though I had um, read most of these pieces, I must say, when you read them out loud, um, you made me understand them in ways that I didn't before. So that was, um, that was wonderful, and thank you. Oh, I hope that it did justice to those of you who are listening who wrote these pieces because they really were remarkable, every single one of them. Every single one of them had something so important. So Catherine, Catherine, you must have been reading my mind because I was thinking the exact same thing when you said it. And, you know, the pieces were all so incredibly powerful. You know, some brought me to tears, which oh, God, me, yes. is not an easy thing to do. Um, and, and then, I mean, to hear you read them just kind of brought them to a whole other level. And, and I'm wondering, so the writers who are here, and there's many of you that are you know, listening right now, what did it feel like for you to hear Abby read your work? If you want to throw some comments into the question pane, I'd, I'd love to share that with the audience. Well, it's so different to hear your own words in somebody else's voice. You know, and I'm sure that, you know, often you, you, a, a, a reader will get it wrong or will emphasize things that you hadn't meant to emphasize. But it just goes to show how many different, how many different responses there are to the written word. And you can't really control it. Um, sorry, I'm lighting a cigarette, which I should not do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, but I, I'd love to know. It's it's easy to read your own work, or it's easy for me to read my own work. But it is it's a real responsibility. But when it's read out, and when it's read out loud, either by yourself or someone else, it's a whole different experience. I think it is. It is a whole different experience. I don't. That isn't to say that reading isn't probably the best experience of all, but to hear somebody else's take on it or the writer's take on it is another layer. Right. And so people are, people are writing in and saying, you know, it's, it sounded so much better with you reading it. Um, very silly, but thank you. <laughs> someone, someone said that it, uh, hearing them in your voice made it sound like your story also. But they all are my story. Right. They all are our stories. That's what's so remarkable about this. We're all, we've all, well, I haven't. I've only suffered for my daughter, but we've all had so much suffering and so much longing in common oh, that it is everybody's story. But each individual has written it her own way, and it's, it's, Remarkable. Sorry, I've used remarkable far too many times <laughs> today. <laughs> so some people are asking, you know, what can they do to, to take it any further? Do you have any guidance? The only guidance I have besides joining, can I talk about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we're putting up, I think, I think Cher is going to put up a closed Facebook page for any of you who want to continue as a group writing 
And I'll be happy to dip in every so often with, with assignments and comments. But for me, when the most helpful thing I did when I first started to write um, was, was join a, a, a workshop where nobody was nasty, nobody was a pushover, but there, were, there was encouragement from all sides. And I'm hoping you guys will, will want to do this, because I think it's terribly hard to write all by yourself, especially if you're just beginning. Although I do think some of the people writing today have probably been writing for a while. But anyway, that, that, that's my sort of all-purpose all purpose suggestion. The other is to read and read and read and write and write and write and read it aloud to yourself to see what the rhythm is, to see where your voice suddenly goes dead and you realize either this is boring or I'm hiding here. Because sometimes when your voice, and you'll know it when you read it, when, when your voice gets bored with itself, either there shouldn't be there or there's something hiding behind that paragraph like behind a couch, and you have to figure out what it is that you're not saying. Or you have to figure out that this just doesn't belong here, and you'd written this witty sentence, and you can't bear to cut it out, but finally you have to. I, I can't, I mean, I, I learn so much being in workshops, and giving workshops, I see how helpful it is for everybody. So I encourage everybody who's interested in continuing this to join the, the closed Facebook page that um, Christine and Kathy have put up to share work that you're in the middle of or starting out to do. I, I just think the more you read and the more you write, the better you get. I was also going to suggest, I mean, there are a few Memoirs, there's certainly Kathy Rich, who many of you probably know, um, The Red Devil, a memoir of metastatic breast cancer, and another remarkable memoir by Lucy Greeley called Autobiography of a Face. Um, and then there's one by Anatole Broyard, who had prostate cancer called intoxicated by my illness. These are all approaches to cancer that are very helpful to read. Um, but that, that's, that's, that's my, only real, my only real suggestion. Join this group and read and write. Um, so, um, as we have it up on the slide, and you'll be able to see this um, after the presentation, um, we'll be sending this out as well, but the Facebook group is called Writing with Others, and if you search under groups on uh, Facebook, um, you will find it. And if you run into difficulties, um, you can contact uh, Christine at the uh, email that's on the screen. Um, you know, Abigail, I wonder in the few minutes left to us, um, I saw that you have an essay in uh, this month's um, uh, Good Housekeeping. Oh. And, um, <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I found this very interesting. It's a very short essay, and um, it was about um, reflecting on a young man um, that you met when you were 17. Um, and yeah. I have I, I printed it out, and I cannot read as you do, but um, the second paragraph is um, uh, everyone, it was, you had met him on the, the beach where you went every summer. Um, everyone knew everyone else, but this boy was a stranger. He looked almost like a man. I was <laughs> 17 and looking good, and I got up and strolled into the water as nonchalantly as possible, what with my heart beating so fast, I dove through a wave, and when I surfaced, there he was. His eyes were merry, but they were old, as if he knew things I'd never know, but life still amused him. And I, I'm sorry for mangling your words, but... You're not at all! Um, but when I read this and your essay, I was struck um, that I wondered 
um, did this come out of some of the exer you know some of the types of exercises that you have talked uh, with us about because it seemed uh, very simple in its sentence construction and um, I was just wondering I was so curious after you'd spoken to us and I read this I'm like it would be very interesting to know how did this essay come about well it happened <laughs> <laughs> A, a friend of mine in the workshop I gave it at, the Bened at Benedictine had written about going to meet her old love. That's not part of this of, of the essay, but she had gone to meet her old love, and she put rouge on and bought new clothes, and it was very exciting. And then she met him, and he was heavy and bald and happily married and millions of children. And the daydream died. And I thought, my God, how do you live without this daydream? How can you stand it? And so I decided to write this old, this old, you know, this sort of, I mean, I got married when I was 18 because I was pregnant. And I just, and, but there was this boy I saw who was sort of the last thing I saw before I went under. So I Googled him and I wrote him. And he wrote me back such a wonderful note. He remembered just what I'd remembered. And it was like being 16 again or 17 again for about, oh, I don't know, seven hours. And then it sort of faded. But that's how it began. It began by thinking, how can you lose a daydream? How can you lose the person you find yourself thinking about when all else fails. <laughs> and I oh. think we, we all have somebody that either got away or we left, you know? I don't know how to say that any better. Uh, but I, I liked particularly towards the end when you described, you know, how pleased you were to get this lovely email back from your old flame. And um, you said, I was 71 again, not 17. But I folded my friend's email and put it in a special section of my wallet where I keep my Medicare card. He <laughs> <laughs> laughed. Oh. Uh, I, we have the link to that essay. Um, we posted that on the closed Facebook group, so you can find it there. But it is, it's in uh, Good Housekeeping. Um, I'm sure the, the Good Housekeeping would love it if you bought the magazine, but you can also find it online. That's um, so funny, and it's such a funny place to find yourself writing about this in good housekeeping. It was, yeah. Thank you for, thank you for liking that. Oh, and um, I just have to just say how much we enjoyed um, your two-part presentation. And um, now I'll um, turn back to Christine. I enjoyed it very much myself. Thank you very, very much. Yes, Abby, thank you so much. I mean, this has just been really, really a treat for all of us. Oh, I hope so. Mm. And Catherine, thank you for all the homework you did and all the hard work that you put into this to make it such a, such a great webinar. Yes, thank you. Thank you oh, all. My, my pleasure. Thank you. Are we saying goodbye? Well, let me just, let me just finish up here. So thank you all for your participation and the writers that sent, sent in your messages, sent in your work. Uh, we hope that you join the closed Facebook page. And uh, a recording of this webinar will be available soon. You'll be notified when it is so you can listen to Abby read your work over and over again. <laughs> Thank you so much. Don't forget to check out SHARE at sharecancersupport.org and the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network at mbcn.org. Thanks so much. Thank you both. Bye. Bye-bye.